Hey guys, welcome back to the Perfect Timepiece channel. My name is Josh, and I do have a little bit of a cough today, so if I'm speaking a little quieter, or if I cough in this video, I do apologize. It's also late at night after my 9 to 5 job, so people uh, out in the street out there are like going crazy and like killing each other. Um, not really, but there will be some sirens. I'll do my best. Anyway, you guys are here for season two of Watch Talk Wednesday. Now, today we have three different stories uh, that I would like to cover, and hopefully you guys will find these interesting. So I have my handy dandy trusty uh, laptop, nicknamed the little engine that could, uh, right below me here. So if you see me looking down, that is what I am looking at. So let's hop right on in. Um, so the first article we're going to talk about today is from Worn and Wound, and uh, this article, you know, it isn't really about watch news per se. Basically, this is just a documentation of one of Worn and, Round, Worn and Wound's writers, excuse me, that's a tongue twister, um, basically taking a trip to Iceland and the watch that he took with him. Now, I have to commend him on his photography skills. I thought it was amazing, and I thought the way that he kind of wrote the story of how the watch played into his little journey to Iceland was also really inspiring. Um, there's, an explore, uh, there's an exploration factor to uh, having watches and wearing watches. You know, if, if you're wearing a sports watch or a rugged watch, um, you have this thing in the back of your mind, or at least I do, where you want to then go out and explore. So it's really cool seeing somebody in the community actually taking a watch uh, with them while they explore the world. Uh, I think it's, you know, it's something admirable and I think it's something that all of us would love to aspire to one day, you know, traveling the world and documenting our experiences with watches. Now, the first watch, uh, sorry, not the first watch, I'm used to buying guides. Um, the watch that he took with him is the Casio G-Shock DW-5600E-1V. There are some pretty cool pictures that, uh, that the writer of this article took. I particularly like this one where his watch is like holding his passport and his plane ticket. <laughs> um, but also you get a whole bunch of pictures in this article with him traveling with the watch. And uh, honestly, Iceland is such a beautiful place. I think it was a really good place to showcase <coughs> this or really any watch. All right, we're back from a little bit of a cough break. I am literally dying, so if you appreciate the dedication, uh, to, of, of mine to make this video leave a thumbs up. Um, but in addition to kind of traveling around, he did talk about the extreme conditions that the watch was subjected to while he was on vacation. Uh, he was saying the temperature uh, in Iceland was very um, uh, inclement, right? So it changed all the time. Basically, he would go from like freezing cold, uh, like outside air temperature to like a hot spring lagoon at like 130 degrees or whatever. I don't know, maybe that would burn you. Um, but basically, the watch survived. There were no compromises in terms of its accuracy, which, you know, that's kind of expected because it is a quartz piece. Um, and you know, usually I, I wouldn't even cover a topic like this because it isn't about an automatic watch and that's kind of what I feel, that's, that's what I'm drawn to about watches. Um, but I do think that this article definitely made up for it by just sharing one guy's adventure uh, through life and exploring a country with a watch. And I think that that is something that we kind of have to bring back uh, to the watch community. All right, so the next article that we are going to be talking about comes from Hodinkee, I believe. Yes, Hodinkee. And it's basically talking about Grubel Forsey. Uh, again, please do not criticize me for the pronunciation, or you know what, criticize me for the pronunciation. 
Um, I looked it up before I filmed this video. I actually did due diligence, um, but apparently no one really knows how to pronounce the name uh, except for probably the people who founded the company. Um, but basically, uh, GF, which is what I'm going to refer to them as, so you don't have to hear my horrible pronunciation, uh, basically came up with a 180 day power reserve watch. That's, that's right, 180 days. Uh, this watch here has a 48 hour power reserve, uh, not a 180 day power reserve, and they're being really secretive about how they actually managed to do this. And um, I think for good reason, right? People would just copy them. Uh, 180 day power reserve is kind of crazy. Um, I. You know, I, I talked a little bit uh, in the last season of Watch Talk Wednesday, which you should go back and watch if you want to learn more about watches, um, about how the watch industry needs to innovate and it needs to push the boundaries and kind of give, you know, courts a run for its money, um, you know, by, by doing cool mechanical things or adding cool mechanical features at a lower price. Now, this GF watch is probably never going to be at a price that a regular consumer can, um, you know, afford. But I do believe that this does set a precedence, and if they, you know, release their intellectual property at any point in time, other watch manufacturers will catch up and maybe 180 days will become the new standard. So really quickly, in this article, I just want to show you the um, pictures of the watch movement. All right, so this picture is a conventional watch movement with a three-day power reserve, which is probably very similar to the Christopher Ward C60 Trident 600 that I'm wearing, uh, which has an ETA 2824 movement. Uh, and then, basically, they have a very rough outline of the mechanical nano watch movement, which is what GF is calling this movement. And really, the only thing that kind of has changed um, is this mechanical nano mechanism. Basically, uh, there's some speculation that everything is like so small, it, it has like, it either runs on like air friction or electromagnetic uh, uh, energy. I'm not entirely sure, obviously they're not releasing a whole bunch of information on it, but they did release uh, this little propulsion wheel uh, prototype back in 2014. So. This could be what GF is using in that new movement, but we're not exactly sure. Uh, if you uh, go down in the description down below and actually click the link and read more on this article, um, some people have some really good opinions uh, in the comment section down below, uh, you know, below the article, not below this video. Um, so you should definitely go check those out. Honestly, it goes a little bit above my understanding of watch movements, although I did really enjoy reading them, which is why I am passing uh, that information on to you. Up next, we have the last article that I'm going to cover today. This is from a blog to watch. And basically, um, <clears throat> I don't know how to pronounce any of these people's names, and uh, I I, I, you guys are just gonna crucify me, so I'm just gonna go like off the deep end and totally not pronounce them right. So, Jean Cloud Beaver becomes interim CEO of Zenith Watches as Megadad departs. Now, I don't, if you guys don't know that that was the best pronunciation in the world of all of those names, um, you guys are crazy. Was that a bad joke? Yeah, it was. Anyway, um, basically, instead of having uh, this guy run the company that, you know, looks very happy, they're gonna have this guy run the company. He also looks pretty happy. I don't, I, you know, I don't, I, I probably shouldn't attack these people, like, based on their looks, um, because I look like Frankenstein. Uh, let's be real here. And um, honestly, I, I might work with these companies someday, so I'm just gonna like move on from attacking these people's looks. I'm sure they're very capable leaders. Basically, what this article talks about is, um, you know, Zenith is kind of 
known for their classy dress watches. If you think of Zenith, uh, you are probably thinking of the El Primero. I know that that is the watch that I commonly think of when I'm thinking about Zenith. And basically this watch, uh, th this article, excuse me, talks about how Zenith is changing as a company and kind of what their strategy is to uh, kind of secure their place in the market and maybe hopefully grow. Uh, I do think Zenith does an amazing job with their uh, movement decorations. So personally, I would love to z see Zenith capture a larger share of the market. And I think that that's what they're hoping to do with their, with their new CEO, um, which, you know, is an obvious statement. Every company wants to grow, um, and a new CEO is, is commonly a way to do that. Um, but basically, the article talks about a lot of the problems that Zenith has had in the past, uh, including trying to go and make uh, extremely large uh, pilots' watches that didn't exactly do too well, and I think they're starting to back off of that um, and kind of going back to the bread and butter that is the classy dress watches. Um, and I think that uh, <laughs> Jean-Claude Beaver uh, basically is taking the company and kind of hopefully expanding the classy dress watch section. So actually, if you guys don't know, uh, one little factoid that kind of uh, caught my attention in this article, Zenith, uh, Tag, and one other company are actually owned by this conglomerate uh, called LVMH. Yes, I got the initials correct. Uh, this conglomerate also owns like makeup companies like Sephora and all of that stuff. Um, Jean Claude, uh, whatever his name is, whatever the joke, whatever the running joke is, uh, is actually an insider from that conglomerate, and he's been, I guess, promoted or moved over to run Zenith, and um, I don't know, I, th I think that is cool, I think, you know, he probably knows what he's doing, otherwise, you know, that big conglomerate wouldn't have put him in this position. And honestly, I'm super excited to see what Zenith has for us in the future because I think that their watches are uh, really incredible, incredibly designed, and uh, pretty incredible in terms of the movement with both the uh, 10 uh, hertz operation, or uh, there are 10 ticks per second, 36,000 hertz, um, and the movement decoration. So. Let me know what you guys think about all of this, what you think about the new CEO of Zenith, uh, what you think about the 180-day uh, power reserve watch, and also what you guys think about traveling with your timepieces and kind of that um, like inner adventurous spirit that kind of gets released uh, when reading about the first article. Um, so I hope that this was informative, and I hope that you guys enjoyed your time listening to me rant on and on and on about watches. My name is Josh. You have been watching Season 2 of Watch Talk Wednesday. I will see you all later. Thanks for watching. Bye, guys.